So, we will be discussing the ACC 2025 update for the treatment of acute coronary syndromes. So, this is this updates the recommendation from the five previous guidelines 2013, 14, 15, 16 and 21. So the classification of MI has not changed. So, we have biomarker negative ACS which is unstable angina. Biomarker positive can be NSTEMI or STEMI depending on the ECG finding. This is something you already know. If you have a non-occlusive thrombus, it goes in for unstable angina or NSTEMI. If you have an occlusive thrombus, okay, this is supposed to be an occlusive thrombus, then you have a STEMI. Okay, an important thing which I have always repeatedly said, new onset LBV is not equal to STEMI. This is something which has been carried on, on and on. Some previous guideline mentioned this, so it has been carried over and over and over again. This has long been changed. New onset LBV is not considered diagnostic of STEMI in isolation. You combine it with clinical correlation. A new onset LBV in an asymptomatic patient is not a STEMI equivalent. Please understand this. So, I receive many, many consultations, new onset LBB. So, how new is a new onset? I am yet to find data. I have seen two books. Both of them are Indian books. Say that a new onset LBB should be within 24 hours. That is how new it should be. Again, this is not based on a standard book. This is based on two Indian authors, books from two Indian authors. So, in the ACC 2025 guidelines, four key areas have been updated. Revascularization strategy, dual antiplatelet therapy, lipid management and mechanical circulatory support. This is where your changes have come. So, first is changes in the revascularization strategy. So, now we are going to consider about non-culprit PCA. So, if the patient is in cardiogenic shock, whether it is STEMI or NSTEMI, non-culprit PCA is a class 3 recommendation. Do not do. So, do not do. So, you do only culprit PCA. Do not touch the other lesions. Non-culprit non PCA in STEMI or in STEMI if the patient is in cardiogenic shock is a class 3 recommendation. Do not do. What about if the patient is stable? So, if the patient is stable, non-culprit PCA carries a class 2B recommendation in STEMI patients. You can do at the same sitting itself provided the patient is stable. In NSTEMI, it carries a class 1 recommendation. You can do it in the same sitting if the patient is stable. These are, these are your guidelines. So, I will just be focusing on the new recommendations. In selected hemodynamically stable patients with STEMI and low complexity multivessel disease, not intended for CABG, multivessel PCA of significantly stenosed non-infarcted related arteries at the time of primary PCA may be preferred over a staged approach. That is, you are doing index procedure non-culprit PCA. Okay, you are not, the previous recommendations recommended said that you can do it during index procedure or index admission. That is just before discharge. Here, relatively weaker recommendation. If the patient is relatively stable with low complexity disease, you can do it at the same sitting. So, patient is presenting with anterior wall MI, you stent the LAD. If the patient has another lesion, you stent that lesion also. Provided the patient is stable, the lesion is not complex. Again, not a very strong recommendation. It is a class 2B recommendation. This is based on the BioVASC and the Multistars AMI trial. So, the lesion should be of low complexity with stable hemodynamics, normal LV filling pressures and the patient should have normal renal function. That's why in selected hemodynamically stable patients with low complexity disease, you can do non-culprit PCA in the same setting as the primary PCA provided the patient is stable, class 2B recommendation. In cardiogenic shock, class 3, do not do. Data is based on the culprit trial, I mean culprit shock trial, do not do. What about non-culprit PCA in NSTEMI? So, this is NSTEMI. Again, stable patients, same thing, who are not a candidate, who do not have f main disease, who are not a candidate for CABG, PCA of non-culprit lesions at the time of index procedure or a stage procedure is recommended, class 1. So, you can do it at the time of index procedure or as a staged procedure. So, not at the same time, you can maybe do it just before discharge. So, that is also a class 1. So, index procedure. At the same sitting is still a class 1 recommendation in NSTEMI. So, you do the culprit artery as well as the non-culprit artery provided the lesion is simple with the patient being stable. At the same time is a class 1 recommendation. Alternatively, you can also do a stage procedure. 
In cardiogenic shock, again, do not do class 3 recommendation. Do not do. It should be very clear. Whether it's STEMI or NSTEMI, non-culprit PCI is class 3 if the patient is having cardiogenic shock. Now we come to dual antiparietal therapy. So again, whether it's STEMI or NSTEMI, you prefer ticagrelol or prosugrel in preference to clopidogrel. That is a class 1 recommendation. So whether your patient is going for primary PCI for STEMI or PCI for NSTEMI, you load the patient with prasugrel or ticagrelol over clopidogrel that carries a class 1 recommendation. So you can see here DAPT for one, one year, ticagrelol or prasugrel is preferred post PCI over clopidogrel. So patients with ACS are characterized by a sustained prothrombotic state. Thus you need continued antithrombotic therapy. Cure trial was the basis for aspirin plus clopidogrel, uh, uh, clopidogrel combination. Subsequent studies like the Plateau, Triton, Timmy 38 have shown the superiority of prasugrel and ticagrelol, albeit with a risk of excess bleeds. So again, that's why we prefer prasugrel or ticagrelol because of the superior risk of reduction of stent thrombosis. Selected patients, you can continue treatment more than one year. So remember this, in all the trials, whether it's cure, whether it's plateau, whether it's triton timi, patients at the highest risk of bleeds were excluded. So our data is not that very clear cut in patients with who are at higher risk of bleeds. The default strategy of DAPT duration of minimum one year is applicable to most patients without high bleeding risk presenting with ACS. So ACS, if the patient is having STEMI or NSTEMI, you give aspirin with ticagrelol or aspirin with clopidogrel, with uh, prasugrel. That's a class one recommendation. Clopidogrel, if uh, the other two agents are not available or cannot be tolerated or are contraindicated. If CABG patients, you give aspirin with ticagrelol or clopidogrel. Remember, prasugrel is not given if the patient is planned for CABG. It has not been studied. There's an increased risk of bleed in patients who are loaded with prasugrel and sent to your CABG table. So always prefer aspirin with ticagrelol or aspirin with clopidogrel. Non-invasive therapy. So let's say it's an evolved anterior volume. You're not planning to do an angio. In that case, it's either it's aspirin plus ticagrelol, clopidogrel given when Ticagrelol is not available, tolerated or contraindicated. Remember, prasugrel has not been studied in this population. Okay, it's not been studied in your evolved anterior wall MI population or when you are conservatively managing an ACS. If the patient is post fibrinolytic, only aspirin plus clopidogrel because we don't have data for ticagrelol or prasugrel. In a thrombolyzed patient, the only data is for aspirin and clopidogrel. So, very important. Again, it summarizes all of, almost all of your trials. Routine PCA for NSTEMI and STEMI, it's aspirin with ticagrelol or aspirin plus prasugrel. CABG patients, again, prasugrel is contraindicated in CABG. So, it's aspirin plus ticagrelol or aspirin plus clopidogrel. Conservatively managed ACS, it's aspirin with ticagrelol. Fibrinolytic therapy, it's only aspirin plus clopidogrel. We do not have data for ticagrelol or prasugrel. 